Hey, White Sox fans, guess what? We had so much fun doing a post-game podcast. It's just the third in Southside Sox history. We had so much fun doing it earlier. Uh, we're doing it again with a bigger group. Uh, smart, let's face it, no, no, not insulting those people, but smarter group, uh, better looking, uh, all closer friends to me than those earlier people. I'm just happy to be with them right now. Uh, Zach didn't hear that just now because he was on the early one, but that's cool. Uh, okay, quick introductions uh, before we break for commercial and try to wrap this thing up in a second half. It's Tommy Barbie uh, from the Southeast, like me. Well, we're not from the Southeast, are we, Tommy? But <laughs> we're Close behind, enough. behind that of lines right now. <laughs> it's Celeste Rodonio. Uh, she is, uh, oh man, a, a bright uh, a shooting star for Southside Sox. So now she can hide and be embarrassed or whatever. It's Crystal O'Keefe representing half of the Indianapolis field office of Southside Sox. Let's jump right down to Super Joseph Reeses because he represents the other half. I'm not sure what the latest voting is in terms of the offices uh, at the field office, but uh, you'll uh, send me a memo afterward. We'll see who president is, who is Sergeant at Arms, et cetera. Zach Hayes, ah, pff, you know him from before. I, you're not getting an introduction. Forget that. Look at it. <laughs> his returning champion, Jackie Cresto. And guess what? She keeps the book, the beautiful book. And she shares it with us every time she writes a recap. Unless games are rained down, then she says, forget it. I'm never doing a recap again. And the man in the middle in this big Brady Bunch grid. This is the biggest podcast we've ever had. At least the in the middle for me, it's Tyrone Palmer. He's joining us again. Ah, it, you know, the thing he does most is podcasts. He's like our podcast guy. So he's joined us. Okay, let's get this thing rolling. Uh, okay, well, I don't know. Commercial break? No. All right, let's get this thing rolling. Uh, Post game podcast number four. Hey, guess what? The White Sox are in the playoffs for the first time, winning a division since 2008. Uh, first time in the playoffs since oh, I don't know last year when like if you picked uh, uh, the short straw, you got in the playoffs, and long straw, you didn't. Uh, but guess what? They're in the playoffs uh, with time to spare. Uh, the long wait is over, and I guess, first of all, anybody wants to hop on with uh, thoughts on what it feels like for this sort of to be over, and now we can look toward October. It's about time. I mean, you <laughs> yeah. know, it just felt like a very long, winding road to get here, but now they're finally here, and, you know, Sox fans can officially look forward to October, but it, it just took a very long time. It felt like to get to this point to formally move on to playoff talk. I would just like to express my love for Yasmani Grandal, even though he did nothing of value today. Um, I feel like he is the glue, the missing piece that we needed all along. He's why we're there. I just and he's wanna, so surly. He's so delightful. I was. I just want to push back on that point and of saying he did nothing today. I think just showing up was was. He something. always <laughs> does something of value. Agreed. How about <laughs> Eloy today? How about Eloy today? He woke True. up. <laughs> he woke up. Just in time, as Zach alluded to in the first postgame podcast, to perhaps go down to Houston and have to play left field in front of the choo-choo train and not kill himself. I would like to bubble wrap him, actually, for the remainder of this season. I, I liked Ozzy's idea of having the you know shot collar around him, because I, I think he just needs to stay as far away from any sort of fencing as possible. Do we have an estimate, Tommy, on how many drinks Ozzy had in him when he made that suggestion <laughs> post game? I think about the average amount that yeah, he has right. on any pre and post game show. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could just like find a way to like weigh his shoes down so we can't jump. Because I think that's just don't jump, don't dive. Just take the Manny Ramirez approach, you know, just stay within three inches of your immediate path and don't go anywhere. Or just let Luis Robert go for average. Exactly, yeah. Do that. The Manny Rears approach might be actually to crawl into the wall at Fenway, I believe, when he like like to dis, uh, disappear into the scoreboard. So maybe we just don't have him in left field at all. Only when be... he needs to use the bathroom. Well, that, okay. That... <laughs> just <laughs> have, tell him to take his time. Exactly. If you gotta take the whole yeah. half in, take it. Is did uh, this is a strange uh, clinch because it seems like from about I think Lee Allen said it in the gamer uh, for the clinch 
uh, that it seemed like uh, this has been since about mid-May that we knew this was going to happen for the White Sox. But definitely bizarre because even in uh, 83, when the White Sox won the uh, division by like 20 plus games, another division, <laughs> six other teams under 500, unlike the four other teams in this division, they still only clinched on, I think, September 17th. So uh, it's sort of rare to have it this, this early, but yet have it be this kind of weird slog. And it's a malaise that's sort of taken over the site and even maybe with some readers and commenters, because it's like, we're just waiting for October 4th so that we can turn the dial over onto the 7th and, and make stuff really happen. What's it been like just sort of waiting this out? Have you found yourself not even being as interested in watching? I think it being the first game of a doubleheader during the week, kind of during the workday, kind of contributed to, contributed to, to that a little bit. Um, and while it is the first day that it's been official, like in the back of my mind, it's been a long time kind of uh, since I was worried about any of the opposing teams in the AL Central. I mean, we did have, you know, this five game series against Cleveland on the schedule for a while after um, a, a few earlier games got postponed. Um, and so that was kind of looming a little bit on the schedule, but really as long as they were keeping the division lead over five games, it wasn't that big of an issue. I mean, it feels nice to have it be 100% official, but at, at least for me, it was not, as you said, not the most, thrilling clinch i guess but yeah very grateful though i i will i, I want to clarify that so i'll I mean, take it however i can get it i mean even with the clinch today uh joe i mean celeste is still just talking like indian food with steve stone even steve stone's like god can we just get this over with even though i missed like you know 60 the last 65 games can we just get this over with and get to the playoffs so of course i'm going to respond to celeste about uh indian food and drunkenness and, and whatnot well done celeste well done I was gonna say it kind of the whole thing like kind of feels like when you know two people are like seeing each other and they won't like come <laughs> out and say it and then eventually they're just like yes we are dating and we're like yeah we all knew and like now it's official so like the White Sox are Facebook official now. <laughs> it doesn't count until it's on Facebook. It's true. Yeah, There's got to be a special status for this White Sox season especially piloted by Tony La Russa. Okay it hasn't happened it's many complicated. times. And yeah, that's for sure. Uh, in White Sox history, and especially in, in even in my lifetime, and uh, Lord knows that's a little longer than all of yours, uh, that we've been able to say, hey, what are your memories of, of clinching the playoffs? Uh, does anybody have like an interesting story from, oh, I don't know, the uh, scant years that this has happened uh, three times in, in this century um, that you would like to share? I'm something that's kind of small um well last time the white Sox won the division was 2008 uh, i was in middle school at that time i was on aol instant messenger and <laughs> i was i remember right after brian anderson made that last catch to to uh, seal the game i went on aol instant messenger and i was like posting in all caps to one of my close friends who, who i'm still close friends with by the way um, and, um, we were just having a really good time on the computer that night. And, um, yes, I was happy. I shared some happy texts with him today. Um, same friend. And, you know, so, um, a little bit of similarity there, but, you know, a very different, um, technology was used back then, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Tommy, I know you were at the blackout game. I was, I probably was wearing this hat and thanks everybody for mentioning my cool hat. Real nice to not. I, don't, I didn't want to bring it up. It, I didn't want to bring it up. <laughs> I didn't want to repeat anything that might've been said at the earlier podcast. So, you know. I can oh, yeah. share a memory on behalf of <laughs> Billy. Okay. He okay. was at that game as mm -hmm. well. I was uh, there too. Yeah. Someone. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Someone sold their tickets because they weren't sure the game was going to happen. So he got tickets for like four bucks on StubHub. Wow. Our... How was it not going to happen? Don't you sort of got the tickets specifically to go to that game? How was it going to rain? Well, Listen, how, I don't how know. They ended, up on, they ended up on StubHub. They were very cheap. Um, so they went to a game for like $12. Um, and yeah, they they got to be there. And he said it's the loudest it has ever been. It, like the the loudest thing he's ever heard but yeah he went with our friend Mindy who um she she passed away just 
three years ago and we were thinking about her today because that was just such a happy memory so I wish she I hope that she is watching this all go down from where she is so that was special for us yeah Tommy and I have talked at some length about the black I think probably even uh, Tyrone as well you and I have talked about the just the freakiness of that blackout game and the you know just the, uh, we've almost a got a blackout effect. going yeah the almost <laughs> <You read it. laughs> we coordinated yeah <laughs> Tommy and I just called each other beforehand yeah. Yeah. sorry nice. <laughs> nice yeah really way to go joe come on you didn't get the, you're too busy doing the aol you're doing all the the you know. yeah. are you like 12 how I, i've never <laughs> aged so quickly in such a short period of time how were you in middle school well, I was thinking hey, about it. That's Super Joe. I mean, he was he, he was probably three. I mean, he says middle school. Yeah. But, you know. Well, I remember part of the blackout game. Like I, I was tutoring a kid who was in second grade, and I was realizing that now he's a junior in college, and that just broke my brain a little bit. <laughs> uh, okay, oh. let's do the blackout again. Come on. I, I got one. I remember in yep. 2005. Uh, my friends and I, we decided that we thought the White Sox were going to clinch in Cleveland at the end of the year. So we road tripped out to Cleveland, my friend Matt and my ex-boyfriend. And uh, so we ended up clinching the day before in, in Detroit. So the games that we went to in, uh, in Cleveland, it was just like the cleanup crew. And I am looking forward to going to the game next week and just enjoying the, cre- the, you know, the second string. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That was so delicious in 2005, not only to stave off uh, Cleveland's charge, but then sweep them out of even having a chance at the playoffs. That was like a really nice, I mean, that's something at least you did get to, to witness, Jackie. So, I mean, that's something, you know, and like sort of the negative fandom thing. All right, let's take a quick break because uh, we're yakking on about stuff. And at some point we will let Zach talk. He thinks right now he's just being polite. Uh, He doesn't want to hog podcast, but we are going to call on him very soon because stuff about October is coming up. So let's take a real quick break. Hey, guess what? That break is over. If you're watching us, that break was like that because that was real time. That was real time. Uh, Otherwise, um, you know, I think this is playoff time. So I'll say it again. Whatever they're trying to sell you on the podcast, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Probably something lame. Uh, Okay, let's talk about October. Let's talk a little bit about what we used as our uh, rainy day theater um, copy for uh, yesterday's rain out. And that is how you set up this rotation. Who's your number one guy uh, starting likely in Houston for game one on the seventh? Uh, and maybe who's your number two? Who starts in Houston if things play out as they are? Who's your one and two? Lance Lynn and Lucas Giolito. Yep. yep. Bingo. I mean, what? Dallas Keuchel's got loads of postseason experience. Oh, <laughs> if he touches the mound, it, yeah. it's only because it's a blowout. Like I, mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> he knows these Houston hitters. He knows the ballpark, and, and they know him. <laughs> and and he already gives up too many home runs. I don't want him anywhere near that mound in that short field. No if way. The, if the acoustics at the mound are sharpest he will be able to pick up the trash can bangs better than if he's in the dugout or the bullpen. Something to consider, (laughs) maybe like a game five thing. Um, Okay, so you, most of you seem to be saying Lynn, then Giolito. Is it just either one or is it important that uh, Giolito is your game one starter? No, Lance Lynn is our game one starter. Lynn would be game one. Yeah, Yeah. you guys, and you don't care that he's working on about one and three quarter legs? No. I trust him the most. And you you do not care at all that Lucas Giolito, even on that extra long, chunky rest they gave him for the 2020 playoffs, uh, had a perfect game for five or six innings in Oakland? Still want to start with Lynn. Set the tone. Well, Zach Hayes, this may be an intro for you because it seems like we're taking a little different (laughs) departure in this this more drunken consensus here. That is... I'm sober. Yeah, that is interesting. The only thing I'm drunk on is the the divisional champion White Sox. That's the only thing we're drunk on. Fair enough. I think we're all drunk on that to some extent. But um, yeah, no, ever I think it was um, um, Diane Trevor went the other way for me earlier and went with Giolito game one. Um, 
I'm I'm inclined to go Lynn. I think it's kind of a wash. I also am thinking that if it comes down to like game five, what the state of the rest of the rotation is, if you need someone to go on three days rest, it's going to be Lynn. It's not going to be Giolito. So, um, I mean, ideally it doesn't come to that, but uh, yeah, as has been said already, I want the guy who's been in the world series before. I want the guy who is, you know, the, the big bastard. That's- so clearly number five is going to be Dallas Keuchel. Okay. Gotcha, Zach. Sorry. You're on. Actually, you're on number five is going to be. Oh, you know what? I- <laughs> That's true. Yeah, Ronaldo, uh, uh, bounce back okay, bounce back okay. Uh, okay, uh, home field then. Let's talk a little bit about home field. It does seem to be, this is mm, this might be a trivial point because it does seem like despite Houston having a, a, a rougher schedule, although the A's seem to have disappeared, um, and Tampa will have probably clinched everything maybe by the time they play. I don't really know how their schedule breaks down. Uh, Houston have a, has a tougher schedule, but has a nice, healthy lead on the White Sox for home field. And they're probably on the verge of clinching that home field. Is it important for the White Sox? And I say that particularly because of the two guys we're talking about, Giolito Lynn, Lynn Giolito, being as strong as you're probably going to find in rotations in the playoffs. Uh, does it matter as much being on the road or is that still big a, fa- a big factor that's going to end up hurting the White Sox? I think it matters. I would prefer home. They're, I'm, I hate watching them play in Houston, especially, but yeah, I, they need to be home. I, I really wish instead of tinkering around with this like whole playoff lineup picture that Tony LaRusa has been doing, he would have focused more on home field advantage because it's, I don't want to sound negative, but if it's going to be negative, it's probably coming from me the lack of home field advantage is going to kick the White Sox ass. I I just, that's my inclination. I thought it was funny in the poll that we ran because I just threw it out there. Like, okay, as long as we're doing all these goofy questions, how about just tell me what the White Sox are going to do in the playoffs? And it seemed like we had about half people saying they're out in the first round and half said, yeah, we're winning the world series. So I do think there are a number of people who are sober enough to say, this just doesn't look great. And of course you want to beat the trash can cheaters, you know, and you want to beat them badly, but it's not setting up well. It'd be nice if the Sox had even had a good series in Houston, because then you could say, despite the fact that they have virtually all of their wins this season at home, that, well, okay, they played them tough in Houston, but they did not play them tough in Houston. They played them terribly in Houston, uh, maybe their worst series of the season. And that, you know, it's different. It's a playoffs, but that doesn't bode well. Right. I mean, yeah, the home, lack of home field advantage is a non-negligible disadvantage that they will have. I think it may be a tad overblown in that the team isn't specifically designed to win in Chicago. Like there's nothing really special about guaranteed rate field that would cause this particular group of players to do better there. Um, Obviously their home road splits are pretty significant. Um, I will say though that uh, in, yeah, it was a really rough series in Houston that they had earlier this season. Um, but it was only four games, and that's just a very small sample size. Um, and, yeah, w- yeah, one of those games was actually my only Sox math win this year, and the Sox just nearly always lose when I win in that. So, like, I mean, I- I'll take the fall for one of those four games as well. So, really, it was more of a sample of three games instead okay. of four. And, Joe, you know you need, need now you need to play no more Sox math. Uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't been playing the Sox math habit bit. for now. Come on, you're the <laughs> champ. You're in the Hall of Fame for Sox math. Okay. Uh, I will say, start at, like, Starting on the road is the only way that the playoffs can start with a Tim Manners and lead off home run. <laughs> oh. So just on the bright side. Yeah. Also, I like I, it. one thing I'm curious about, I know Houston <laughs> is slowly catching up to Tampa. I think they're two and a half games back and they've been playing significantly better. Than, so there's a chance the Sox are playing Tampa instead, which I don't know if that's any better, but. I feel not, like feeling, I, not feeling great about that, but yeah, okay. It's there's a, there's less of a bugaboo, I suppose. Although we lose the Keuchel advantage. Come it's on, true. That's a yeah. What are we going to do? Uh, do we have um, this popped up? It was not part of my planned um, questions in the earlier podcast, uh, but the podcast was briefly a uh, power of it was seized from me. And we introduced Tony La Russa into the discussion, and I think it is uh, worthy in retrospect to discuss. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the regular season has not proven him to be um, any sort of special manager. 
uh, at all. I think you can make a strong argument that says quite the opposite. However, part of the reason I guess he's here, aside from just, uh, I don't know, a <laughs> sense of obligation to a guy you fight decade before probably any of you were born, uh, is that come playoff time, something is going to be different. Um, what's your feeling towards Tony at the moment and looking ahead into October, is something going to change? I hope something's going to change. <laughs> um, I mean, he's definitely like grown on me since the beginning. Um, there, there are antibiotics for that. So let's... <laughs> <laughs> Might want to uh, get that checked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like the narrative right now is like, oh, we have to believe in him. We're supposed to, he's the best. Um, everyone stop complaining because we have to. And that's just what it is. I, I hope so. Ricky T is, uh, uh, is watching our podcast because there is a, a gold mine of t-shirt slogans in, in that. And what else we got to do? It's Tony. Uh, Zach, you brought up an interesting point. I'd like you to bring it up in this podcast as well about Tony and his performance in his last World Series, which is, oh, I about an eye a decade ago. Yeah, almost exactly a decade ago. I feel like I've, I've been screaming this from the rooftops every time I hear the like faith in Tony argument is that like we have recent, there is a recent record, recent ish record of, of Tony La Russa being in a deep playoff run. And the last time he did that, he literally brought in a pitcher that he wasn't warming up in like the eighth inning of a World Series game. Uh, I probably should have actually gone and looked at what the details of that were in between when I said it like five hours ago and now, but you know, that's, that's more or less what happened. Uh, that was, that was 10 years ago and a lot of other stuff ago. I don't know. All I'm saying is given Given what some of the bullpen decision making has been this year, I don't have a lot of confidence that that necessarily has got any better. Um, so let's let's hope that they don't make it a problem and that you know they're good enough that it doesn't matter. Everyone locks it down and he can bring in Jose Ruiz in the fourth inning and get five shutout innings out of him because that's playoff magic, right? But... Somewhere, Zach <laughs> yeah. Terry Bevington uh, feels there is a oh, shot in the arm for his Hall of Fame. Don't Can't say think. that name. Hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta call him like we see him and that that he just what zach is saying is he pulled a bevington hey no i mean it's i that's why i thought there was a huge amount of irony in, in firing <laughs> anyone for bullpen management and then hiring tony la Russa. it was the equivalent of what happened with the team now known as the cleveland guardians when <laughs> When Ricky Renneria brought in Rodon off, off of injury and everybody's like, what are you doing? Why is this happening? That's basically what Tony La Russa did, except it was during the playoff run with, with the Cardinals. Like that, that is his legacy up until now. And I hope it goes better, but there is nothing within the recent track record or history to say that this is going to go any better than it would have gone previously. And I'm a person that doesn't believe that managers make a huge bit of difference. So I just find it incredibly ironic that, you know, they fired Ricky Renneria after a failed run in Oakland where basically he had one and a half starting pitchers. And now you have probably the deepest Sox roster in recent memory that is likely going to face a similar outcome going into this playoff run. And I just, I don't know what anything changed other than Jerry Reinsdorf sleeps slightly better at night than he did before. Uh, you're ignoring the fact he invented the closer, Tommy. That's true. Okay. And he had a computer game and it was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, let's, uh, um, I guess it didn't really uh, show in the nightcap, but then we had Andrew Vaughn at third base and Luis Robert was catching and Liam Hendricks was in center field, whatever that was in the, in the nightcap tonight. And still they showed a lot of fight against a team uh, who had its heart cut out, I guess, back in June, but um, shouldn't be hard to take a few more games against uh, Cleveland uh, through the weekend. 
Um, but the offensive explosion in the opener is the sort of thing we've been looking for. And it was pointed out in the earlier podcast that the White Sox are capable of offensive explosions. The problem is then maybe the next game they'll get three hits. Um, is there any indication now that maybe health is coming together um, better than before? I've already mentioned Eloy, uh, that this is a breakout at the right time with uh, seven, 10 games left heading into the playoffs. Do we believe there's any momentum with this offense? Or are we still going to get this spotty uh, spottiness of the offense, especially given we're going to be facing chances are some really good arms from, from here out in October. I think it's good that they started hitting today. I mean, Aaron Savali was throwing 90 mile an hour fastballs right down the plate. So it would be pretty concerning if they weren't hitting them. Um, you know, at this point, like there's pretty much no proven, no correlation at all between how you do in September and how you do in the playoffs. Uh, that being said, like gelling and rhythm is really, really important for a lineup that has not been together at all this year. Um, so even though like in theory, it shouldn't matter, I think, yeah, it actually is pretty important over the next 10 days to get um, Tim and Aloy and Grandal and Luis and Yoan all in positions where, you know, they're feeling like they're up operating as a unit and they're handing things off to each other and they are going out there and, you know, playing with the confidence that they're going to go out and be the best lineup in, in the league, which they can be on any, on any given night. And they haven't had the chance to do that this year. And I think that's going to be really hard to do if they don't find a way to at least kind of get the, get the gears running in that direction over the next, you know, 10, 12 days or so. But there is, that is, today's a good start. Today's definitely a good start. Yeah. I think from a strategy standpoint, having, the protection in the lineup that the White Sox have now is going to be crucial for a playoff run. I just, I still have, you know, concerns on whether or not that's going to translate to scoring runs because they're still hitting the ball on the ground a lot. They're still grounding into double plays a lot. If they, if this is a sign of things to come, perfect time for it. But um, yeah, I just haven't seen that level of consistency yet. I have no concerns, not today. Today is for celebrating. I will have concerns later, uh, but for right now, you can't say nothing to me. I'm having a good night. I like you, should, it. you should continue that thought, uh, uh, Jackie. Tell, uh, uh, tell us what the season's felt like you know, uh, for you, given the fact that the White Sox were most of us, well, I think it was 14 out of 15 on our site. Many of you weren't even with us yet, uh, picked the White Sox for the playoffs. Someone didn't, we're not going to talk about uh, him, but uh, 14 out of 50. So, I mean, it, there was expectations for playoffs, even wild card. I think we had a couple of people pick world series, but, but hopes were high, even catapulting from 2020 with the playoffs that were, you know, like again, coin flip. Um, uh, how, uh, where they're sitting right now, how does that compare to, you know, what you felt maybe on opening day or as the season progressed? Sure. Well, on opening day, I mean, I think we all, uh, we, we kind of realized that our window was opening, right. And that we were, at, if we weren't going to be competitive, we were at least going to be fun to watch for a little bit. Um, but then I, what really changed it for me is when Rodon started hitting, <laughs> Um, and he started making a big difference. Um, and that's something I hadn't really expected from him. And that's when I kind of thought like, okay, this line, and I think I said it in our previous podcast, I thought this lineup was, or this rotation was going to put us on their backs and carry us all the way through. Um, so that's the point where it kind of changed for me. I'm like, no, I think we're going to go not only the playoffs, I think we're going to go kind of deep. Um, so that's what changed. And I, I didn't like living through the last couple of weeks when we couldn't, quite quite get it together but that doesn't matter now we're we're gonna go to the playoffs <laughs> I think we're gonna just uh run on adrenaline the rest of the way because I don't think it's possible for everyone to get totally healthy yeah. so we're just gonna take some like of those marathon gummies and we're gonna go for it <laughs> J J good vibes Jackie brings up a good point and it's easy to overlook now that we're like six months in the season and who thought that the rotation was going to carry anything this year? The fact that this was basically the thing that carried this team, uh, A, because of health, but also because they performed, hardly need to tap into depth, you know, a token Jimmy Lambert once a month, uh, is extraordinary. And the idea that, yeah, they're sort of out of gas, we might not even see Rodon, but the fact that they're even in this position, and this isn't going down to the wire, I mean, it's a minor miracle. And the idea that, yes, that there is something to be said, and maybe that's where Larissa comes in. He's good with that. Hey, uh, it's fumes. I won the World Series with a uh, team two games over 500. 
you know, could there might be some thinking uh, that's that's legit to that of, hey, uh, you guys can do it. It's just it's just a few more weeks. You know, Lance Lynn go out there on two days rest, whatever. Uh, I mean, you can imagine because they've gotten this far and they're still reasonably intact. And I know that they haven't all performed at an optimal level, but I do want to give a huge amount of props to the transactions that Rick Hahn made at the trade deadline. Those bullpen arms are going to make a massive difference for the playoffs where you have shut down experienced guys coming out of the bullpen that will be critical for a team that otherwise is pretty young and, and not necessarily used to that type of environment. Yeah, we can. It's been, it's, it's been lost in the shuffle with, with Kimbrough and Hernandez, both, both flopping, but Ryan Tapera has been outstanding. I Absolutely. trust him. Yeah. I trust him very much deep into October at this point. That's, that's a great pickup without he, even speaking to the other two. And even with Kimbrell, uh, Zach, I mean, as easy it is to say, man, you know, what happened, what's going on here? Okay, the, the alternative would have been like Jace Fry or Jose Re You don't want to be giving those arm. I mean, at least this is a guy who's, well, I don't know, people say he's going to be a Hall of Famer, but I mean, this is a guy who, who has done stuff. So you just want to upgrade every, every spot, even into the bench. And if your 26 man is better than it was at the start of the season, then you're doing something right. I just want to call breaking tea. <laughs> Uh, he does stuff. We'll get that shirt made. <laughs> if they're not listening to this, it. this is like 12 ideas we've given them. Uh, and we just get a tiny penny. So come on, breaking tea. Let's do he it. Yeah. I also think if we're giving shout outs to people right now, I think we should give shout outs to the, not our big guys, but the guys who really are, are like second string guys, but are still doing you know, sometimes as good as our A string guys, like our Lurie Garcia's and Billy Hamilton has stepped up in big moments, you know, Gavin Sheets, um, all those guys too. We really couldn't have done it without them. And the Charlotte Knights in general. Like exactly. Like yeah. Half of their squad. Your mean Mercedes carried the team for a full month. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's been Big contributions Parker. from guys like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing that you do have to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to continue. It's less the same. Not only, have, yeah, I mean, those guys have stepped up. Not only are there names to list, every one of them has. There's not really a guy who's come up. Maybe Adam Engel, you could say, and he's been out pretty much the whole year. Nobody's come up and really failed. Of course, Mercedes did poor enough to end up getting demoted, but all of them made significant impacts. And I would say that's maybe not completely rare for a division winning team, but the fact that all guys like one to 35 or whatever actually can have some ownership and really claim part of that ring. Uh, you know, that, that's something's going well. And yeah, I mean, I guess it does point to how Hans drafted uh, uh, even some of these guys that they've gotten that, you know, as Tommy said, you know, like, okay, you know, it maybe hasn't worked out completely, but you put those guys on the team in position. Cesar Hernandez could be the MVP of a playoff series. I mean, he has that potential. Yeah, I mean, sure. yeah. No, he, he does. I mean, even defensively, I think he plays well enough where it's just like, no, he's not hitting for anything on a regular basis, but he's always been a streaky hitter, but at least defensively, you know what you're getting out of him. But, you know, is probably one of the loudest people on Southside Sox that has complained about the depth. And um, I really have been impressed at how much all of these guys and on the Charlotte system in particular that have stepped up because the White Sox farm system has been derided. You know, it's like once all of the main prospects came up, everybody was like, eh, the Sox don't have anybody out there. And yeah, the pitching is still super thin and don't want to think about that. But from an offensive standpoint, you've had every single guy that has come up really come to play and showcase what they can bring to the table. I mean, even Jake Berger did incredibly well. And you're talking about a guy that basically lost most of his career due to injury. And even he was able to step up and contribute. So, I mean, it's been a really cool run.
Okay, this is a final point, a speed round before we end, but maybe we can get a couple answers in. And there's one guy on this roster who I guess you could say is an X factor. We don't really know at all how he's going to be used. And he is a weapon. And he's a guy who started today, Michael Kopech. How does he get used? Is he spot starting? Is he, is he, uh, is he the, um, not the closer, but the guy, the bulk uh, uh, relief guy? How do you see him being used? Because he has to be employed. You have to start stretching him. You have to start giving him a spot starts. Spot starts. He's not meant to close. He doesn't, he can't do that. Please start him so he can be ready next year and in October. I'm going to disagree. I, like I want, idea. yeah, I want him in middle release though. I want him in middle release. I want him uh, to, to hold, hold the thing down until Kimbrell and Hendricks can get there because he's been amazing in those spots. So he's like a bit of a hater role where he's going to be uh, not really your closer, but sort of your stopper, maybe taking some bulk. Yes. Yeah. I kind of think it's past the point where they can stretch him out enough to be a starter. So I think you kind of have to use him in middle release as kind of the bridge to get to Summer, Hendricks, Kimbrell. Yeah. Um, once again, White Sox, we have solved all your problems for you and we did it free of charge. We know you're watching, listening, reading. Uh, okay. So uh, we got to wrap this up on behalf of Mr. Tommy Barbie, Celeste Rodonio, uh, Crystal O'Keefe, and, and Joseph Reeses down in the Indianapolis office, Tyrone Palmer, Jackie, good vibes, Jackie Crestel, and Zach Hayes, our, he's truly our returning champion because he's back again. Uh, thanks, as always, for reading, uh, watching, listening. We got great, great postseason coverage coming up for you. And uh, hey, stick around for the rest of the regular season with us as well, because uh, maybe we'll make you laugh.